As we head into the next section of the course, some of you who took the 200-120 exam might look at this and say, wait a minute, you know, is RIP back? Is distance vector back? Now, if you didn't take the previous version, don't worry about it. You're not missing anything. I just want to bring those people up to speed that indeed distance vector routing protocols in RIP version 2 are back on the exam. Uh, for those of you who didn't see the 200-120 version, they took distance vector protocols in RIP version 2 off of the exam for the first time, I think, in the history of the exam. Uh, it was kind of stunning, and now they've put them back, so we're not going to spend any time questioning their wisdom because whatever time we spend will be wasted because we've got to learn it anyway. And RIP version 2, it's a good starter protocol. It's a good way to get started with routing logic, uh, going beyond the walkthroughs we did earlier, and we will do plenty of debugging. We will see RIP version 2 in action in plenty of lab work here in this section. But first, we need to go over some distance vector protocols and a very brief history lesson, I assure you. RIP version 2 is really the last distance vector protocol standing. It's the last one you're going to see in today's production networks, and frankly, you're not going to see a whole lot of it. Now, I'm not down-talking it. It does have its place inside you know, a private network, but it's not one that you're going to see used over wide area networks very often. Now, the original version of RIP, version 1, of course, is rarely, if ever, used, but it is still available. The original IGRP was a distance vector protocol and today it's the interior gateway routing protocol, or it was, because it's not even available on modern Cisco routers. You type in router IGRP and we could do that in our labs and it's just gonna say, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. So you're probably thinking, hey Chris, why are you bringing it up? Well, not only should you know that IGRP was a distance vector protocol, but the enhanced version of IGRP, which is EIGRP, that's what the E stands for, enhanced, it's a major part of today's networks. You can't go anywhere without running into EIGRP, and it's going to be all over future exams as well. But for right now, we're going to stick with our distance vector protocols. And a couple of issues with RIP version 1 and IGRP in particular, and the first one is that they both sent a full routing update at a fixed interval. RIP version 2 does this as well. And you might look at that and say, well, that's not so bad. You know, full routing update every once in a while. You know, every once in a while might be one thing. But by default with RIP, we're talking every 30 seconds. And it's really unnecessary because hopefully, I mean, if, you're, if your network is so unstable that routes are changing every 15 seconds, <laughs> then uh, you should probably be fixing that and not be here. I kid, of course, but you really should be there. You don't need those full routing updates like that. And what you'll see with our other protocols, with OSPF and with the IGRP, is that the notification happens when there is a change and only regarding the change network. If you have 90 RIP routes, you don't need 90 RIP routes advertised by every interface on a router twice a minute. You know, that's, that's just a waste of resources all the way around. Now, IGRP and RIP version 1 did not understand variable length subnet masking, VLSM. RIP version 2 does. And if you're not familiar with VLSM, hang in there with me. It does. We are going over that in the next section. We're going to have plenty of exercises here on the board for you to practice with. And you'll get the hang of it in a heartbeat. But right now, I just want you to remember, it is important. And RIP version 1 and IGRP did not support it. They also didn't support any kind of packet authentication. Occasionally, we might want to set it up so the routing update we're getting, we know we're getting it from a trusted source. And with RIP version 1 and IGRP, that could not happen. RIP version 2 does offer that. Now, about routing loops, you want to watch these terms on your exam. Routing loops happen at layer 3. Switching loops happen at layer 2. And at layer 2, we have something called the spanning tree protocol to help us prevent switching loops. Routing loops happen at, router, excuse me, at layer 3. And this happens when packets are on their way to the destination, but somewhere in the middle, they end up going around in a logical loop rather than moving on to their final destination. And the packets finally just time out. So, you know, your packets are leaving, but they're not getting where they're supposed to get. They're getting lost in the middle. Now, the protocol behaviors, the distance vector protocol behaviors we're going to talk about here and do a walkthrough or two on the board, they were designed to stop routing loops. They're very good at that. They are important, but they can cause serious headaches for you on occasion, especially this very next one called split horizon. you got to watch this one. Now, the rule is very simple. A route cannot be advertised out an interface if it came in on that interface in the first place. Now, that's me being a little less fancy about it. If I was going to state the rule formally, I would say that a route cannot be advertised via an interface if that same interface is the one that learned about the route in the first place. So if this route we have on the board, 20000-8, comes in on fast Ethernet 00, it cannot be advertised back out that interface. 
Now, for those of you who are familiar with this from previous versions of the exam, years past, say, um, you want to watch this because Split Horizon is not enabled on serial interfaces that run Frame Relay. Hmm. And for those of you that that doesn't mean anything to you, it will later in this particular section. But that's one time Split Horizon is disabled by default. All other times it's going to be enabled. Now about this next one, Route Poisoning. This is a fascinating little thing, especially first time you see it. And it really does help with distance vector protocols because what I want to discuss with you right now is a real issue that distance vector protocols have. Because you may be listening to this so far and thinking, well, they don't sound so bad to me. Why don't we use them more often? Well, what we want as often as possible is a nice, quiet, stable network where all of our routers have reached what we technically call a state of convergence. And it, it's just another way of saying all the routers agree on the routes that are available, even the ones that aren't. Their routing tables are much the same, and they are not currently updating their tables. We like that. And a major reason that you don't see much distance vector routing out there anymore is that these protocols are painfully slow to converge. You can hear it in my voice. It hurts to even talk about. Seriously, they're really slow. Even in a lab environment, I've had little three-router labs that, um, you know, I would put RIP on and do a demo. And even then, when you changed something, when you added a network, especially when you subtracted a network, removed one, then they could really become a pain to deal with. And that's where route poisoning comes in because that sounds like a really negative thing, right? I mean, it's got the word poison in it and how positive can it be? But it's actually a positive thing for our networks and you will see why at the beginning of the very next video.